Hello everyone, welcome to History Tea Time Chat Live with me, Philip Lacey Brule, and this is the British History Channel. So thank you if you are coming back. I know there's lots of you who join me each week and I'm really grateful, but if this is your first time here, then welcome as well. We have this show each uh, Wednesday live at three o'clock UK time where we talk about all sorts of different history. Today we're talking about why is it that the heir to the English and now British throne, subsequently British throne, is the Prince of Wales and how that links to a place called Ludlow Castle, which um, I may go into more detail about Ludlow in a subsequent live stream as well. But the links to the Prince of Wales are quite interesting as well. So we'll do that. Um, I am streaming live on YouTube, Facebook and Instagram. Um so if you are new here, or maybe you've, well, a few of you have been around, Emma, Deborah, hi, welcome. Welcome to Ed, who is a new member on YouTube as well. Um, yes, so if you've been here around for a while, then you'll know that obviously I do this weekly show, but each month there is a historian interview, which goes live. This past weekend, that went live, the latest one, Dr. Nicola Tallis talking about her new book, Young Elizabeth, uh, Princess, Prisoner, Queen. And so you can um, see that the book is out tomorrow, 29th of February, uh, everywhere, I think, maybe other than Australia. I'm not sure when it goes live there. But you can see my interview with uh, with Nicola already on YouTube. You can also, as you might well be doing now, catch up on the podcast, which is also the British History uh podcast it's just British history or if you look at my name as well if you're not quite sure because British history obviously is quite a general term and so you could come up with a few different channels when you do a quick search but if you look for my name Philippa then you probably will find the right one so I hope you're all well I have a quick shout out please to do for Gary Brooke and Andrew who've all become patrons this uh well in the past week because one of the things as well I should mention is when you uh are a patron you get to ask questions of my guests and I have today posted in patron uh patreon excuse me the uh, request for some questions for Nathan Armin who is going to be uh who I'm going to be interviewing in a couple of weeks time Nathan you might have seen around as uh the uh antagonist protagonist up against Matthew Lewis look lots of discussions around the princes in the tower because Nathan comes from the sort of Henry the seventh side of the argument um he's from Wales which of course is where Henry the seventh was born Henry the seventh was born at uh, Pembroke Castle raised for a little while at Raglan Castle before having to scoot over to the continent for safety so um anyway so uh Nathan is uh, is pretty much a Henry the Seventh scholar, actually. I would say uh, he's written a lot on the Pretenders. Uh, so these are the uh, the men per Perkin Warbe Warbeck and the other one whose name has escaped me. Who the uh, who the other side? <laughs> I don't know why it has to be sides, but anyway, of the sort of what happened to the princes in the Tower argument or discussion are saying um that there actually were they were actually the rightful uh, king richard the fifth uh, excuse me um edward the fifth and his younger brother richard duke of york and they actually were coming back and trying to claim the throne back off uh henry the seventh so anyway so i'm going to be speaking to nathan in a couple of weeks time he has a new book out this year as well about more uh, specifically on henry the seventh so i'll be asking him about that um either way if you all would like to put your questions to Nathan, please do come along. A lot of you on here, I know already are members of my Patreon. You can go to patreon.com forward slash British history and you can you can submit your questions to Nathan. I've also got some other uh, exciting interviews coming up uh, in this spring as well. So I'm going to have to have a sip of water now. How is everybody? Jack says, which side are you on? Hmm. Nathan or Matthews. Well, if you fancy going back and seeing my, I think I spent about an hour um, on one of these lives going through the um, evidence that has been put forward in the latest uh, book by Philippa Langley and um, uh, well, there was a show on TV 
and I went into my well just the evidence really so my thoughts on what has been presented um so uh, if you fancy you can go back and have a look at that uh <laughs> so well I will come back to Matt Matt has already been a guest on my um uh on my podcast he was my first ever guest um, he was my first ever historian interview and we were talking about Ludlow Castle which I'm going to be talking Lambert Simnel thanks Jenna um, and we were talking about Ludlow Castle in fact I interviewed him at Ludlow Castle so when you see that interview and I'll put a link to it in the show notes or you can look it up on my YouTube channel um, it, um, we, it's not a green screen behind that it is actually Ludlow Castle we, we met there and sat on a picnic bench and he spoke about the Wars of the Roses and uh, and how Ludlow Castle um, sort of came into being. And yeah, so, um, uh, so yes, so I will put that link into the show notes afterwards. Uh, I meant to do it before, didn't get around to it, but thank you for the reminder, I shall do that. So... <laughs> And of course, I could get Matt on to um, to redress the balance in the latest uh, on the princes in the tower. Uh, okay, so I also want to mention before I get into talking about the Prince of Wales and, and Ludlow that look out because I have got a bit of an announcement to come out. Can't do it until tomorrow at the earliest. Might not be able to do it tomorrow, but I do have uh, an announcement coming out. Um, it might be a bit of a geeky one. It might be not be of interest to anybody else, if I'm perfectly honest. But anyway, I will do it regardless. And uh, and it'll be a take it or leave it. <laughs> one. OK, so. Um, the Prince of Wales. Now. With so much, I think I don't think I'm on my own with this. Something that is customary and familiar takes a bit of a it needs to take a bit of a step back to even question why it is the case and in today's live I wanted to um, talk about why is it that the heir to the British throne has the title Prince of Wales now I you could easily argue that now that it is a British throne that that is that kind of makes sense that the heir to the throne would be the prince of one of the um, areas, countries, actually, within the, the wider country. So, but that was, sorry, but excuse me, that wasn't the case. It was, it predates the British throne. Um, so we have a Prince of Wales who's actually an English prince called the Prince of Wales. So I want to roll it right back and explain that history and also then I want to do a quick link to Ludlow Castle because Ludlow Castle is a fascinating place um if you are coming with me on the rise of the Tudors tour which looks at the story of Henry the Seventh and Arthur Tudor and the Beauforts and all that then uh, we're going in September 21st of September there are a couple of places left if anyone's interested to check it out on www.britishhistorytours.com look on the tour page it's there and um, we're going to Ludlow that's one of the places and I couldn't be more excited I it's 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 a little bit um, along the lines of Kenilworth Castle, where it's too far away from London to be really well visited. Um, you kind of have to, especially if you're coming from abroad, you have to go a little bit out of your way to go there. Um, quite a bit out of your way, actually, to go there. So I'm very excited about taking a group. I love taking groups to places where they may not have been able to go or wanted to go or hadn't thought about going <laughs> before. And this is one of the places. But before we get there, let's talk about the Prince of Wales and why Prince of Wales is the title given to the heir apparent to the British throne. And that's it's actually happened since the, uh, the uh, excuse me, the 13th century. So in the 1200s, it became the title of the heir. Now, the current Prince of Wales, of course, is William, the son of Charles III. And once William becomes king, that title will be conferred on his eldest Prince George. There's a difference now in the um, uh, 
the, the, the late queen brought in um, a difference to the old system of primogeniture uh, and it's now the eldest child but they had a boy first so it doesn't actually make much material difference at the moment um, so it England and Wales what you have to understand and I want I probably will get into this with Nathan who is a proud Welshman the, the, there's a distinct culture of, of a Welsh culture that that is distinct from the English culture and I don't think that's probably well that that go that feeds in quite significantly to why I think it became the title of the English heir um and that identity I would say despite best efforts of some of our previous rulers has been able to remain um distinct all men by the way in Wales can sing that's all just one thing <laughs> and I'm I should ask Nathan actually whether he can sing or Tom Jones is what is Welsh isn't he that he's just he's just indicative of the of the Welsh men mm -hmm. um so we go right back to the reign of King John we've covered King John in previous lives I'm sure we'll cover him again inept in the extreme nasty man but inept as a king as well and um uh and under during his reign excuse me wales was able to become more organized if you like in in um opposition to to the english king um and they organized themselves under a, a single ruler leader his name was Llewellyn Ap Lewelth. Lewerth? Llewellyn Ap Lewerth. I hope I've pronounced that correctly. And when John died in 1216, he was succeeded by his nine-year-old son, Henry III. And there was probably enough warring factions within, well, there was, within England to deal with by the council who were looking after the country on behalf of the new king, headed by a wonderful William Marshall, um, is one of my faves uh, in history. Uh, and and they were they were busy dealing with that. And uh, but one of the things that they did was organise a peace treaty for like in 1218 in Worcester, a peace treaty was uh, signed with Llewellyn Ap Lorworth. Um, and the, the council, the, the King's council acknowledged, um, Lorworth as, uh, as lieutenant, if you like, Henry's lieutenant in Wales. That arrangement though, didn't last very easily, very well. Um, the descendants of those who agreed just started to fight again over land and titles and it all went a bit to pot. In 1267, there was another Llewellyn, Llewellyn Ab Grifford, and he established himself as the lord over all of the other Welsh chieftains. And Henry III recognised him as the Prince of Wales. So I suppose his um, contact <laughs> in Wales, he talked to him, he deals with everyone else. And Perhaps Wales could have remained a principality, excuse me, of uh, of England, swearing allegiance to the king. Um, however, that it just didn't seem to suit either side for very long, and rebellions would would um, kind of bit par for the course. Then you get uh, Henry the Third's son Edward the First, known as Longshanks for his uh, long limbs six foot two he was in uh in in a time where well in the 13th century where apparently people were shorter i'm not convinced we hear too many exceptions for me to be convinced but anyway now he proved uh more able than his father at subjugating the welsh mainly because he was really really violent um and he he forcefully brought llewellyn back yeah it back in line um Llewellyn had thought to take advantage of Henry III's death, uh, underestimating Edward quite significantly. 
And so Edward basically stamped him out. Um, and, uh, um, and yeah, so, so he was like, no, England is going, you are going to be subservient to England. That's it. You to me. Um, um, but in 1283, Llewellyn ap and his brother David, uh, Daffid ap uh, launched their own rebellion. But Edward once again quashed it. Now, Llewellyn was killed in battle. Daffid was caught by his own people. Um, on Mount Snowdon and he was he was turned over to the English king and tried and found guilty of treason now this was the first time um that your uh, that the um uh sorry I think I've just gone off Instagram the this was the first time that rebellion had been treated as a treasonous offense so you think about it, treason it, it's it's a crime against your lord so rebellion edward was was he was stretching the definition of treason and i'm actually going to be writing about um about this and about the treason act um in my next blog for patreon and on substack so i'll we'll, we'll go into it in, in in far more detail so not only is dafford the first um, rebel to be tried for treason, he's the first one to get his very own special execution. This is where we see the beginnings of being hung, drawn and quartered, or more uh, accurately, drawn, hung and quartered. And if you watched my interview with Susie Edge, we talk about the uh, supposed significance of each of those stages and the stages of that horrific way of being executed. Um, so you can check that one out as well. I'll put the link into that uh, interview. Now, what happens to be, uh, sorry, what seems to be an early indication of Edward's intentions, he gets his queen, Eleanor of Castile, to travel to Carnarvon Castle, which is in Wales, uh, it's in northwest Wales, to give, when she's pregnant, to, in order in order for her to give birth there. So in 1284, you have an English prince, because the baby was a boy, an English prince born in Wales. His name was also Edward. Now, so you, you have this, um, uh, so you have the, the king in England, he's claimed Wales as a principality. The queen has given birth to a son in Wales at Carnarvon Castle. And when that baby... Edward got to the age of 16. Um, his father conferred on him the prince of title of Prince of Wales. Um, uh, they did that at Lincoln, which we talked about Lincoln the other day. Edward, um, he was actually their fourth son, but he was their eldest surviving son. Uh, and, and so therefore he was King Edward I's heir. So he had the, the title Prince of Wales conferred on him at 16. By the time he, uh, so, but, um, excuse me, but he, then he, he was the heir to the throne by virtue of being the, the oldest surviving son. And therefore those two things got linked and have been, that tradition has persisted now down the centuries. So even when it's conferred on an, on a, so it's been conferred on the, on the eldest son, and when, if, when, and if it's happened, the eldest son um, predeceases their father, that title will be moved on to the the next eldest surviving son, as was the case with Arthur Tudor to H Henry, who became Henry the Eighth. So I said I would. I'm going to bring you up some pictures of Ludlow Castle because um, so Ludlow Castle, uh, shown here. Um, on the podcast, I'm sorry if you if, you, if it, there's just some photos of Ludlow Castle. Ludlow Castle is on the well, English Welsh border. Like I say, check out my interview with Matt Lewis after this. He goes into it in, in into the castle's history in a lot more detail than I'm going to be able to do with you today. Um, and this castle has was in the possession during the Wars of the Roses um, of Richard, Duke of York, the father of. Uh, who would be the, the, the men who would become Edward IV and Richard III. 
So Richard, D Duke of York, holds Ludlow Castle during the Wars of the Roses. Um, and when Richard is killed in battle, this Ludlow and his other possessions go to his eldest son, Edward. Um, and Edward, I mean, the, the, again, the, uh, Matt goes into this in, in quite a lot of detail and it's very, very interesting. But Edward would have known this castle well and he would have known the area well. And when um, Edward, the, Edward becomes Edward IV, um, he establishes here a, a council to govern the, the Welsh areas. It's the, the, the Council of the Welsh Marches, um, and that he establishes here. And in 1473, Edward IV sends his eldest son, another Edward, to, um, to Ludlow. He's, um, he's young, but he's, he's got the, the title of head of the Council of the Marches. Of course, he's the Prince of Wales. So this becomes... Um, the seat of the Prince of Wales. It's a great place for him to learn a little bit about kingship as well. I mean, this is like a this is like a perfect diplomatic mission for a would-be king, a king in training. Um, the photo that I'm about to put up. So um, the photo that I've got up on the screen now is the, the steps outside of the uh, this lovely square. Sort of, it looks like a low keep, but it's, it's not the keep, but it's all very uh, similarly uh, styled. And you have these external stairs that is actually leading up into the Great Hall, which was on a first floor level, again, quite similar to um, places like Kenilworth Castle. Um, now, when Henry VII becomes king, he also installs his eldest, eldest son at Ludlow, Arthur Tudor. And he um, Henry VII is always keen, he's always got an eye on establishing um that you know the, the the Tudor right to rule. And one of the one of the ways of doing this is to um continue with tradition. And um and so his eldest son Arthur sent to Ludlow. And again, obviously Arthur is Prince of Wales, and he is the, also the head of the Council of the Marches. Um this is where Arthur brought his new bride, uh, Catherine of Aragon, back to in 1501. It, it, so if you're looking at the screen, you can also you can see the steps up there again. Uh, and the royal apartments are up to the right. On the right-hand side here, this circular building is, I don't think I've got another photo of that. That is the um, Chapel of the Holy Sepulchre. And it there was a walkway at uh, sort of, first floor level between the royal apartments and the chapel so that the the prince um the lord the whoever was living there at the time doesn't have to uh well could get straight into the royal closet which should be on the top um so yeah so arthur brings catherine of aragon here in 1501 of course arthur dies in 1502 less than six months after they are they're married um so he dies here and when we're coming on tour for the Rise of the Tudors in September, we will be visiting here and St. Lawrence's Church in the town, which is where um, Arthur's heart is buried. We'll also be visiting Worcester Cathedral, which is where his body is, is buried. Um, Catherine's daughter, that she would have by Arthur's brother, Henry VIII, because Catherine of Aragon obviously goes on to marry Henry VIII, their daughter, Mary, she actually spends 19 months here as Princess of Wales or Prince of Wales. I don't think she actually ever, it, it was never, the title was never conferred on her officially, but Henry referred to her as the Prince of Wales, or Princess of Wales. Um, and she she did spend so a significant amount of time here, 19 months over the period of 1525 to 1528, um, in lieu of, of course, him having a, a son to have taken um, that position. Um, later on in the next century, the future Charles I um, was declared Prince of Wales here by his father, James I. Um, he was also um, a second choice, a uh, second son, his, his elder brother, uh, having died, Fred, uh, Henry Frederick. Uh, so in 1616, Charles I was, Charles 
the would be Charles, sorry, the future Charles I was um, was pronounced Prince of Wales at Ludlow by his father. So it was um, once you get into the civil wars with Charles I, Ludlow holds out for the royalist cause. Now, it actually survives, I think, fairly well for somewhere that um, that stood against the parliamentarian forces, but clearly not that well. Um, we're, we're, I think we're quite lucky to have so much of it to, to still see. <clears throat> and actually, there was a garrison here. It was still occupied throughout the Republican era. And um, when Charles II was restored, he... Um, he um, also restored the Council of the Marches, which had sort of fallen by the wayside. But neither the castle as a um, as a, a stronghold or as a as a usable used castle, or the Council of Marches as a as a ruling um, local ruling body, neither of them really took um, root again, and so um, the castle just kind of went into decline. As opposed to, I don't, I don't think, and I think Matt covers this in his interview. Actually, um, I don't think it was uh, slighted particularly, but and it, I think he goes into that in more in more detail because I can't quite remember. But the the castle steadily declines. It's still in uh, it's in private ownership, so but you can go and visit Ludlow. Like I say, we're taking the group there in September. I'm really, really looking forward to it. Um, Catherine, uh, sorry, excuse me, Amanda says, Catherine didn't initially want Mary to go to Ludlow. I wonder if she was worried about history repeating itself. Um, well, I'm sure it's a very good point, Amanda, because I'm sure that, um, yeah, I'm sure that, uh, excuse me, Catherine wouldn't have been particularly happy about seeing her daughter, one, go off so far. Uh, I mean, it's, it's fairly... It's a few hours trip now, but it would have been days worth of uh, a, a, of a trip um, during the Tudor times. What we um, don't think about, and James Clark, uh, if you've listened to any of the interviews with him about the dissolution of the monasteries, what we forget is the Tudor period is a time of modernisation in a way but it's the, the 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 landscape is still very medieval travel is difficult it's via muddy roads that are impassable uh during certain times of the year which is why actually the rate of dissolutions slowed during the winter and sped up again um once the weather improved there was practical considerations that maybe we wouldn't think of today with getting around um so yeah which is quite interesting there's something else I was going to say about that now but I've forgotten what it was okay never mind um oh well, I know what it was so when one of the one of the um slight mysteries is how Arthur's body was transported from Ludlow down to Worcester he actually, it, the body actually went via a place called Budley and a quite major uh, palace where actually the, um, it was a manor house, but Tickenhill Manor it's called, where the by proxy wedding of Arthur and Catherine had taken place. Um, Arthur had stayed there quite often. Um, you can't see any of it now. <laughs> you can't go to Bewley and see any of it, unfortunately. Uh, it's been built on. I think the remaining parts of the manor are incorporated into a house, which you, again, can't really see, and surrounded by a housing estate. So um, it's really difficult to pick out where it would even have been. But it's it was a significant uh, royal home. And he would have gone from Ludlow to Bewley, Budley is a river town and I don't know, I haven't seen any particular reason why it wouldn't have been the case that the body would then be transported via the river from Budley to Worcester. Um, Tickenhill Manor is very, very close to the river. I mean, it's, it's a small town, uh, Budley is. 
still even today. And Worcester Cathedral, uh, where Arthur is buried, was also not only on just on the river, but had a river entrance as well. Um, but I don't know. Maybe I would love to discuss that with somebody who knew who knew more. But knowing the area very well, I live around here. Uh, I, I I I would uh, hesitate to say they would have gone by road. I don't know why they would have done so. In um, it was April, wasn't it? Known for our April showers. So yeah, I don't know. But there you go. Just before we get off Ludlow, I've got one more uh, thing to show you. So this is. Um, Oh, I don't think I've got another picture. So this is over uh, one of the, the the entranceways at Ludlow. Oh, I wish I had a picture. Did I forget to put one on? Um, there is, I did, never mind, never mind. So uh, there's the keep at Ludlow. It's the, it, it, Ludlow Castle was built 1087. At, in stone straight away, which which actually I know we think of um, Norman castles as being of stone, but a lot were built of wood first, and then they were re replaced with stone. Ludlow went up straight away in stone, and to the left, um, on the left side of the picture that I'm showing you at the moment, you can see a squarish tower. That was the original keep, or is the keep, and that would have been the original entrance into the main precinct of the castle. There's a dry moat, you're, you're high up, so there's a dry moat, and, and there would have been a drawbridge, usual sort of drawbridge, whatever, into the keep. And then they decided that probably wasn't a great idea because it meant that the keep was not impregnable. And the whole point of a keep is to be as secure as possible. It's the last retreat place. Um, so an entrance to the right of the keep was created, and this is it now. And you can see uh, from the brickwork that it's been altered in terms of size. And the um, the uh, you can see two um, crests above the the doorway. One of them is uh, that of Elizabeth I, and the other one is of the Sydney family. Henry Sydney um, was installed as uh, head of the Council of the Marches under Edward, uh, excuse me, under Elizabeth I, at the um, sort of suggestion of Robert Dudley, his uh, brother-in-law or their kin somehow. Uh, maybe not quite brother-in-law, actually. But anyway, the Sydneys were... Uh, hit, uh, Robert Dudley's sister had married into the Sydneys. So anyway, so that's just one extra thing for you about that. Um, I am, like I say, really looking forward to Ludlow Castle. Now behind me, um, you can see two books. So I will mention these. The Palace by Gareth Russell. That is our next book in Book Club, 10th of March which is week on Sunday, we'll be discussing the palace. So if you want to be part of book club, patreon.com forward slash British history. If that's too close to uh, to get through reading a book, I mean, you're perfectly welcome to come along if you haven't read the book. To be honest, we have people come every time who just want to hear the discussion and then get into, uh, into, the, um, into the book. But our next book, um, the gold has been rubbed off, so actually you can't see the title very well behind me. But that is Dr. Nicola Tallis's book on Margaret Beaufort. Absolutely fascinating. Um, if you want a bit of a warm up into that, I do have an interview with Dr. Uh, with, with Dr. Nicola Tallis on my YouTube. Uh, I think we did it in November or October. So it's quite a recent one about Margaret Beaufort. Uh, but it's a great book. And we'll be discussing that book um, on in Book Club on the 12th of May. So you've got a little bit of time if you would like to join and catch up uh, and sorry, excuse me, and read that book and, and join us. There's loads of other benefits. Like I say, if you join or if you're part of it already, have a look out for the post about asking for questions for Nathan Armin, um, about all things Henry the Seventh, the Beauforts, the Pretenders. Were they pretending? Were they really the heirs to the throne? No, I don't know. Oh, Melissa, I'm very glad you're enjoying it. Thank you. Marianne, hi, welcome. Um, so, uh, like I say, look out for a... Um, oh, do I know if Dr, uh, if Nicola's book uh, yeah, on Elizabeth will be on Audible at some point? Yes, it is supposed to be. It is supposed to be. Um, I'm not sure if it's immediately can't remember what she said when I asked her that, but it will be on Audible, which is great. That's how I read most of my books. And then I get the full book as well, because I like to 
I like to break the spine and I like to write in my books. <gasps> I know. I know. Nicola would hate me. Gareth actually would hate me too. Nicola and Gareth would both hate me for the way that I treat their books, but it's because I love them and I like interacting with them. And I think you should with a book. I was very pre like precise with my books growing up and then I did a university course and they were like write in them we want you to write in them so I did and actually it was a breakthrough I love it um yes Marianne I also uh, struggle with like reading too much crap eyes crap eyesight I'm afraid now let me tell you about one more thing before I leave you to your day the full speaker lineup for the Stuarts return. So this is this the online history festival. We have had the Stuarts back in 2022, I think it was. Um, we're following on from that. And we've got Katie Wignall, Julian Humphreys, Professor Alice Hunt, Gareth Russell, uh, Andrea Zuvich and myself talking. And the talk titles uh, are Gareth is going to be talking about the life of a Stuart Queen, Anna of Denmark, fantastic woman she's if you've read the palace you'll have read the um chapter in his book in the book about Anna of Denmark uh if you want to know where Elizabeth I's wardrobe went listen in uh Professor Alice Hunt is talking about Oliver Cromwell and the English Republic this was a talk that we were um at, lots of people asked for you know what was going on during that time it's 11 years the Republic and that's a non, not insignificant time. But of course, when we start looking back into history, I, I, I feel like it's, it gets, it gets um, Constantina down uh, and it's sort of, oh, we had no monarchy and then uh, in 1649 and then in 1660, we did again. Yay. <laughs> so, yeah, but what happened in the interim? And it was, it was uh, interesting. Uh, Andrew Zuvich is talking royal mistresses, the tenuous power of beauty at the Stuart court. Fantastic. Julian Humphreys is talking about, well, his title is A Hunted King, The Escape of Charles II After the Battle of Worcester. Um, I mentioned that, I think, last week. Uh, it is, it is, what I was going to say, insane. Let's use that word. Uh, it's a bit of hyperbole. But how, how, how Charles II escaped after the Battle of Worcester is a harrowing, I think, story in that he was nearly caught so many times. He really did. It really was not a um, uh, a given that he was going to escape. And had he have not, uh, yeah, another um, what if of history. Katie Wignall, who is a fabulous blue badge guide. She is at Look Up London on Instagram. If you don't follow her already, do so. You will love her videos. Lots of lots of information about London. Really um, interesting. She's doing a talk for us on the Great Fire of London. And then myself, I am going to do a talk on the gunpowder plot and with an emphasis on what drove those conspirators I've put here to plan mass murder. That might be a little bit, well, it's not extreme, actually. It's not extreme. Um, I will clearly go into it more when I'm doing my talk, but the plan for the gunpowder plot the, the, was to rid not just a, a, the, uh, the country of the king and the prince of Wales and the queen would have been there, but the entire House of Parliament and House of Lords. Everyone who was ruling the country at that point, bar three or four people, would have been in that, uh, would have been in the house, uh, uh, the Palace of Westminster and would have died. And, and so I've gone into, in my talk, what drove them to get to that point where that seemed to be the only and the best plan um, what drove them to it. So I'm going to be talking about that. It's a lot about oppression and um, extremism. Uh, but I think it's going to be um, interesting. I hope you I hope you agree. You can get your tickets for that at thestuarts2024.eventbrite.co.uk. And if you're a member of my Patreon, follow the link on the post from within Patreon because you get a quite a significant discount. Um, Okay, everyone, was that all I wanted to tell you this week? Oh, had tonight. Right, so I'm afraid had tonight has um, 
been postponed till next week uh, due to illness. I'm so sorry about that. Um, but um, we will be back and we will be talking about William Marshall, who I, I really admire as a man from history. Um, I think I'm understanding the, the obsession with Richard III because I think I have one with William Marshall. So that will be uh, next week now. I am I apologize about that. Um, have a look. I will I will put and well, if you're watching um uh, live, then uh, look out for in a bit, but there is get so I'll put the link to the interview with uh, Nicola Tallis. That's the latest interview that's available now on YouTube and it is available to listen on the podcast. I didn't do any editing, by the way, on the podcast. So if you're thinking, where's the intro music and the outro music? I haven't done it. That's why. It just makes sure that it gets on there without um, without any faff. Um, also, the link to the interview with Matt Lewis. And please come into Patreon and put your questions for Nathan Armin. I'm, he's hilarious. And um, I'm really looking forward to interviewing him. I will be sending out my usual newsletter. Uh, this weekend, philippab.substack.com, where I should be able to make an announcement uh, about something that is happening tomorrow. Like I say, it might be a bit of a geek niche, a niche geek announcement, but anyway, <laughs> I shall do it anyway. And I will be back next week for uh, History Tea Time Chat Live, and we're going Romans next week. We're going to be talking Romans um, because I, I like them too. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much for spending your time with me. I hope you've had a good time with me today and I will see you all next week. All right. Bye bye.